So, so far we've talked about uh, qualitative um, system dynamics, which is, um, where's that? That's me. Is that showing correctly on the screen? It's not showing correctly on mine for some reason. Let me just stop that share a moment. Try it again, sorry about that. Seems very weird. Okay, I'm not sure why that's doing that, but we'll we'll do it this way. We'll do it the, uh, the old fashioned way. So yeah, so far we've talked about um, uh, uh, qualitative system dynamics, so building causal loop diagrams to try and think about um, what the, the, the influences are within our system and the direction of those influences and the polarity of those influences. How does the increase of one thing lead to either the increase or decrease of another thing? Um, and you've had a bit of a practice seeing how that might uh, generate some insights that you can draw from the system that might then inform uh, interventions. Uh, there's also something called quantitative system dynamics where essentially we do the same kind of thing uh, but we we've got some numbers that we can plug in um, to, to to get more information about uh, some of the dynamics of the system how they're working so let's go back to the um, chicken and egg system uh, that we talked about briefly before the exercise so we said that uh, chickens lay eggs and eggs hatch into chickens and the more chickens there are the more eggs get hatched and the more eggs that get hatched uh, the more chickens there are um, so here we can build a quantitative system dynamics model to represent that system because we can attach numbers to describe the flow rates here. Um, so we can say how many eggs chickens lay per unit of time, whatever our unit of time is in our model, and we can say how many eggs hatch into chickens per unit of time. So we can attach numbers into these uh, dynamics. Um, to do that, we need to think about uh, some of the core concepts of uh, system dynamics. So um, whenever you're building a system dynamics model, there are um, uh, key building blocks that you need to use in order to build uh, a, a, a SD model. Um, and uh, you'll, you may uh, hear them referred to as uh, stock flow diagrams or stock flow models. Um, if people say, say that to you, that's, they mean a system dynamics model. That's, that's what we're talking about. So these th these things can be a little bit odd to get your head around so i'm just going to spend a bit of time sort of explaining these to you you have to think quite differently for system dynamics um, and i say some people like that uh and then you have people like mike who would rather uh, shove his head down the loo than, than actually uh, do anything in system dynamics but um uh, there's no right or wrong answer here so the first key building block of system dynamics is uh, the stock so a stock holds the stuff that's flowing around our system. And the best way to think about system dynamics models is kind of like a plumbing system, okay? And imagine water flowing around a system. So a stock uh, holds the stuff that's flowing around. So imagine a, a, a water tank, okay? Then we've got flows, and flows are the things that allow that stuff to move around the system. Uh, and the rate at which that stuff flows uh, can be controlled by a valve. So imagine water flowing through pipes. So you're, you've got things flowing between stocks and they're flowing down these flows and the rate at which uh, that, that stuff flows uh, can be controlled. Now, as well as the stocks and flows, we've also got uh, things called variables um, and variables essentially represent things that are not otherwise captured by the model, uh, but which will influence a stocks level or a rate of flow. Uh, so it might be that we have something, uh, it, so in our example, the chicken and egg, the laying rate of chickens may well be a variable that will affect the uh, flow from um, uh, the, 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 of the laying of eggs. Um, so you can see in those two examples, the stock is kind of a noun here that represents eggs. It's, it's a thing, it represents a thing that's being held. and Laying of eggs here is a example, good example of how we would describe a flow. So it's the process by which something flows in from one thing into another. Uh, and then we've got a variable which will determine uh, the, uh, the, or influence in some way the, um, the stocks and or the flows. Uh, and if we've got variables in our system, then we also need these things called links. And links basically 
uh, indicate that a variable uh, or indeed a stock level or a flow rate is affected by a stocks level or a variable. So it might be that we have a link here to link up laying rate to the laying of eggs to say that the laying rate of chickens, which we can specify, will affect the rate at which uh, this flow rate here, the, the, the flow which represents the transition from a stock of eggs into something else, and that represents the laying of eggs. So um, let's put this into our, um, our example chicken and egg model here. So let's think about this. So let's say we know that uh, chickens lay on average uh, five eggs per week, uh, and we'll assume they're all fertilized uh, for a moment, uh, and we'll assume that uh, fertilized eggs take on average uh, 21 days uh, to hatch. Um, and I actually did some research where we did this, that's about right. So in our model, uh, we're going to start with the chicken. The chicken came first in our, in our, in our scenario. And we're going to start with 100 chickens and no eggs. Okay. Uh, let's say we want to track our chicken and egg populations over time. We want to track the number of chickens we've got, the number of eggs. What do you think is going to happen in that system? Anybody? Exponential growth, but nothing for the first nearly three weeks. Yeah. Well, Other than lots of egg laying. Interesting you say that. So yes, you're, you're right. It will be an exponential growth. Um, however, in a system dynamics model, there's a little quirk, which I'm going to come on to next. So uh, yeah, we would expect a, basically a population explosion because um, uh, there's, there's chickens, they're laying five eggs, and then those eggs are hatching. And then uh, they're, they're lead, leading to even more chickens. So every chicken that lays five eggs is going to uh, give birth to five more chickens who are going to each lay five more eggs, etc., etc. So we can see a population explosion uh, happening there. And of course, um, uh, that will be an exponential curve because it's very similar to what we see, unfortunately, with the COVID pandemic in terms of one person will infect so many other people. So let's say one person infects uh, uh, two people, those two people then infect, infect another two people, those two people infect another two people, and so on and so on. Hence why there's so much focus on the R number, which, which determines that the average number of people who are um, uh, being infected in one infected person. Um, now, it's interesting that you, you said that about there will be nothing happening for the first few weeks. Uh, leads us in quite nicely into um, uh, some of the quirks of system dynamics models. They behave a little bit differently from some of the other models that you've seen so far, which we will show you. Um, and it's not always intuitive. There's a very different way of thinking with system dynamics. Um, so, first quirk, the things that are flowing through the model are not separate individual entities, but they, they are essentially a continuous mass. So that's why I said think of water. So when we did discrete event simulation last week, we thought of individual patients flowing into the GP surgery or into the emergency department, and each of those was queuing for a process, and they waited for a resource to become available, um, and then that process was done, and then they moved on to the next thing, or they left the system. That's not how it works in system dynamics. The, the entities, whatever your, your, um, uh, your entities uh, are being represented in your model, are actually not individual things. They're, they are continuous mass of stuff. So like, imagine water. Another key thing, uh, we drummed it into your head about the importance of ensuring your models are stochastic, i.e. they have some randomness uh, within them be to capture real world variability. System dynamics models are not stochastic. They're not random in any way. They are um, deterministic. Um, that is to say that uh, every time you run the model, you will get exactly the same results. There's no randomness and there's no variability. Now there are ways in which you can include uh, um, uh, randomness within a system dynamics model um, in various packages and Insight Maker, which is the packages uh, you'll be using for system dynamics, um, you can indeed do that. But strictly speaking, a true system dynamics model is deterministic. Uh, and that's because you're not actually interested in the, in the variability. You're interested in the overall dynamic of the system. You're saying this flows into here at this kind of rate and that flows into here at that kind of rate. What does that mean? That's, that's essentially the question you're asking of, a, of an SD model. So it's a very different way of thinking. Um, and typically with system dynamics models, we're looking for those kind of general patterns and dynamics in the system. We're not using a system dynamics model 
to get predictions such as we think you're going to need you know two doctors to meet that level of demand 60 percent of the time a system dynamics model will not tell you that kind of information by default um, and it's not really the, the the kind of use for system dynamics model essentially what you're trying to do is to get some general sense of the direction the dynamics of the system so you can you can uh, put in place uh, interventions to try and tackle that so let's look at an example of some of this for our model so we said that eggs will take on average uh, 21 days to hatch um, let's imagine we've got our our time unit in our model is weeks because we've got uh, 21 days hatching time and we know that um, uh, chickens lay an average of five eggs per week so we'll use our unit of time in our model as weeks how do you think we're going to describe the number of eggs that are hatching per week based on what i've just told you there Once, once you get past the first two weeks, it's five. But so it's just at that rate of five, five per number of chickens from three weeks ago. You might think that, and you would be so, very reasonable in that assumption, but that's not the answer. So each you assume five hundred okay. eggs, isn't it? So, yeah. So how would you describe? So let so you know a chicken. Um, uh, the sorry, you know the eggs take on average three weeks to hatch, and we know that chickens on average lay five eggs per week. If I need to tell the model how many eggs should hatch per week, and we know that eggs take on average three weeks to hatch, how do you think I'll do that? Is it five thirds of an egg per chicken? It, it is indeed. <laughs> yes, I said it's a bit weird. Um, so uh, it is indeed uh, five thirds of an egg. Um, so uh, basically, uh, it's, or it's essentially it's the number of eggs over, um, over three. So let's think about why that is. So if we had one egg, it would take three weeks, 21 days to hatch. But in system dynamics world, you don't wait three weeks and then the egg hatches. In system dynamics world, a third of that egg flows off out of the stock per week. In other words, a third of the egg hatches per week. Now, clearly that's nonsensical in, in, in the real world. But in system dynamics world, that's how it works because it's, it's saying that a third of that is coming out of that stock and flowing away each week. That's the dynamic. So if we had two eggs, each week, one third of each egg would hatch, which means after a, a single week, we'd have two one thirds of an egg hatched, or in other words, two thirds of one egg. Um, because if you think about it, after three weeks, we'd expect two chickens because we've got two eggs and they take three weeks to hatch. And indeed, that's what would happen. We'd have uh, three weeks of two thirds of an egg hatching, which would be six thirds of an egg, which would be, oh, sorry, six thirds of a chicken, which would be two. So essentially what we're saying is um, we would describe it, the number of eggs hatching per week as the number of eggs multiplied by a third, a third for each egg uh, we have. So if we've got 10 eggs, uh, then we'd have 10 one thirds of an egg that would hatch per week, which we can just simplify that to the number of eggs divided by three. Um, so that's, it's a little odd <laughs> to get your head round, um, but that's how it works. It's, it's a different way of thinking in terms of system dynamics, but you're not thinking of individual eggs. You're thinking of a continuous mass that represents eggs and a continuous mass that represents chickens and the things flowing between them. And a third of your egg mass is turning into chicken per week, um, which is very odd when you say that. But that's exactly how you need to think. So um, in order to develop a, a system dynamics model, there's lots of um, uh, different software packages uh, that are available out there. Uh, one of the um, big so, um, system dynamics packages is uh, called the, uh, I think or Stellar. Um, uh, it's a great package, we've used it before, um, but uh, like Simulate, which we briefly mentioned last week, is a, a quite an expensive piece of software. But there is a freely available, uh, free and open source piece of software out there called Insight Maker, which is a, a web-based uh, software so you don't need to install anything which is really nice um, and it's a really nice piece of software that allows you to develop um, system dynamics models it also allows you to do agent-based simulations I've not explored that um, and it's I, I think the way it approaches it is a little bit different to the way we will teach you uh, in this course which uses um, a Python based framework which is much better for what we need um, but just to flag off it, it it does those kinds of things as well but it's really good for system dynamics and it's simple drag and drop. So you can really easily put together models 
uh, and you can re really easily share stuff with anyone anywhere in the world and obviously that sort of fits in nicely with with our um, with our ethos uh, so let's have a look at uh, insight maker now um, so uh, I'm just going to create a blank insight for a moment so if you get, uh, create a, a new insight when you log in uh, it gives you a little demo instructions there you can click that to, to clear that away um, and you'll see up here that uh, we've got information uh, that allows us to add the building blocks that I've just been talking about um, and you can see the stuff for agent-based simulation so you don't need to worry about that um, but the stuff up here stock variables and converters don't worry about converters at this stage um, but uh, stocks and variables and the flows and links are the things that you'll be using uh, the most here so let's say I've got a stock here um, and I'll call that stock A and then I may have another stock called uh, oops, stock B and I can literally just click and drag those things around really easily uh, and then I want to say that stock A flows into stock B so I make sure that flows and transitions is highlighted there and then I uh, hover over the middle of the stock that it's coming from uh, and I left click and drag it to the, the, the stock it's going to uh, and that will set up a flow so that now says that stock A will flow into stock B, okay? And it might be that I have a variable that determines the rate at which stock A flows into stock B. Uh, so I'll just call it rate. Oops. So I can set up a variable here and then I can click on links up here. And then if I do the same, if I hover over the middle, left click and drag down to the thing that it's going to influence, I can now say that stock a flows into stock b and this rate variable here influences the rate at which uh, th that flows between a and b okay uh, and you can set that up if you click on the flow rate here lots of information comes over on the right about that particular building block so in this case the flow rate will default to zero that is uh, nothing will flow between stock a and stock b but i can change that by clicking into it and clicking the uh, the drop down arrow and I can set up an equation. Now I've said in this case that it's dependent on the rate. So let's imagine in my simple example uh, that uh, the rate is uh, uh, half. So uh, let's imagine the rate determines the rate of flow from stock A to stock B. So I can simply say uh, the rate times two, if you imagine it's double the rate, uh, uh, will determine this uh, flow from stock A to stock B. Uh, if I then click on stock A, we can see there's an initial value which defaults to zero so let's imagine I start with 100 and none in stock B so I've got a hundred units of stuff in stock A uh, I've got nothing in stock B and I've got a flow rate that goes between them which is uh, uh, influenced by this rate variable here and it's basically whatever the rate is times two so let's say um, I'm going to set the rate to one so that should mean that every time unit in the model two units of stuff will flow from a to b so we start with 100 here it's going to flow at a rate of twice this variable value which i've said as one so it should be two units of stuff if you flow into stock b uh, per time unit so i can run that i can click simulate uh, and this will um show you the uh the the stock levels by default over time uh oops, oops. sorry it's because of my display uh, so you can, oh, I can't get to the, sorry, zoom's in the way. Okay, um, let me, oh, I can't get to the close. <laughs> That's annoying. Okay, what you'll have seen briefly, apologies, I, I matched that up. Um, what you should have seen if my uh, display was working correctly, which seems to have gone a bit weird, um, the, uh, you saw one uh, was going, uh, one stock level was going down and one stock level was going up uh, and they were both linear. Uh, and that's simply because um, one, the st level in stock A was going down, and it was reducing by two units of stuff per time unit. And the uh, level of stock uh, B was going up each uh, time unit. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to reset this. So let's have a look at uh, the chicken and egg model. So here's what I made earlier. So here 
uh, I've set up uh, the chicken and uh, egg uh, model here. Now this, you may take a little bit of thinking through this uh, because you may have by default thought, okay, so we have uh, flows between chicken and eggs in both directions in a loop, but that's not the case. So it's true that eggs flow into chickens because eggs become chickens. So eggs flow out of this stock and then flow into being chickens. They become in this stock. But it's not true that chickens become eggs. Chickens lay eggs, but they don't turn into eggs. So they don't flow out of being a chicken and turn into an egg. Okay, But it is true that eggs will turn into chickens. So we've got a flow rate here between eggs and chickens, which is essentially eggs hatching. Uh, and we said the uh, when we discussed that before, we said that um, that's essentially the number of eggs divided by three. So that's what I've put in my flow rate here, eggs over three. But we also need to specify the laying of eggs. And essentially here, uh, eggs are essentially coming into being from nothingness in our model. Now, very often you'll want to do that in a system dynamics model. And in Insight Maker, it's a little bit uh, fiddly, unfortunately. If you want to have something flowing in from nothingness, uh, the way you need to do that is to add a stock. So let's say we wanted uh, uh, something flowing into this stock from an outside influence that's not modeled. The way I'd need to do that would be to put in a second stock temporarily. I'd draw the flow between them and then I'd remove this stock here. And now that flow represents a flow from nothingness into this stock, okay? So just a little tip, that's the way you'll need to do that uh, for something like this, where essentially you're not flowing from something that already exists in the model, you're essentially just flowing in uh, from uh, an outside source. And this rate here is, represents the, the rate at which eggs are laid. And that's dependent on two things. It's dependent on how many chickens you've got and the laying rate of chickens, which makes sense because, you know, the, the, how many eggs come into being is dependent on how many chickens you've got and how fast they're laying eggs. And that's essentially what this says. And that laying uh, rate we define here as the number of chickens multiplied by the laying rate. So if uh, chickens are laying five eggs a week, uh, which I've set up in this variable, in laying rate, so I've set up a value of five, then essentially the flow into eggs is the number of chickens that we've got times by the laying rate. So if we've got 10 chickens, it'd be 10 multiplied by five, we would have 50 chickens per time unit. And our time unit here is gonna represent weeks. So that's how uh, eggs come into being. And then eggs will then flow into becoming chickens. And we can see already that reinforcing loop uh, starting to appear. So you can see that uh, eggs are becoming chickens and then chickens are laying more eggs, which are then uh, causing there to be more eggs, which are causing to be more chickens, which means more eggs, which means more chickens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And indeed, if I run this, this may not come up great uh, because of my display. Oh, there we go. Table view, nice. So, if we have a look at this, uh, you can also set up a table view just to keep track of your stock levels over time. So, at the start, we've got a hundred chickens and no eggs. At time unit one, so after uh, one week, we've got 100 chickens still, but we've got now 500 eggs because after the first week, our 100 chickens have laid 500 eggs. Okay, uh, let me go back to the slides because this will, I've got a copy and paste of this. So here we can see so after week one, we've got a 500 eggs and 100 chickens. After week two, we've got 266 uh, recurring chickens. And 180, uh, sorry, 833.33 recurring eggs. Let's think about why that is. So at week two, we've got 100 chickens that were there before, plus we've got a third of the number of eggs that have now hatched into chickens. Remember, they are hatching into chickens uh, continuously. So a third of the eggs that we've got, which was 500, have now hatched into chickens. So if we add the 100 old plus a third of the 500 uh, new chickens, which are from the eggs, we get 267, uh, 267 chickens. In terms of the eggs, after week two, we've got 833 and a third eggs. That's the 500 eggs we had previously 
plus 500 new ones because after another week uh, our 100 chickens will have laid another 500 eggs five eggs each so we've got a thousand eggs but then a third of them have hatched into being chickens so a third uh, off that thousand will give you uh, 833 uh, and a third eggs so um I hope that makes sense. You've got uh, chickens here starting with 100, they lay 500 eggs, and then by week two, you've got those chickens you had before, plus uh, a third of the uh, egg quantity that you had have now become chickens. And then, uh, simultaneously for the, chick uh, for the eggs, you've got the 500 eggs you had before, the 500 new eggs, but a third of your old eggs have now hatched into being chickens. Does that make sense? It's a bit weird, but that's how it works. Um, so you can see in this uh, graph uh, uh, that you're tracking the um, chickens and eggs populations over time. You can see we have indeed got that exponential increase where we're just very quickly overrun uh, with both chickens and eggs. So that's a sort of whistle-stop tour of um, quantitative system dynamics. Uh, and in the next system dynamic session, uh, we will, uh, entitled Insight Maker, we will get you to actually uh, build a quantitative system dynamics model. So you'll build on the chicken and egg model uh, and you'll build that up to um, uh, incorporate things like uh, not all chicken. Uh, that doesn't happen in reality, of course, because, you know, chickens die, unfortunately, um, and not all eggs will be fertilized and all sorts of other reasons why we aren't uh, drowning in chickens and eggs. Um, so you'll add to that model by putting in some, some extra stuff. Um, we'll do that in the next session. But to close this session uh, this morning, uh, what I wanted to do was to hand you over to one of your fellow um, uh, HSMAs, uh, Dave Spencer. Um, Dave, earlier in the year, did some fantastic work um, looking at using system dynamics, using InsightMaker, um, to build a model of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to try and get some insight about how uh, they could best uh, uh, try and cope with this pandemic locally uh, within Devon. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Dave now who's going to talk you through the model and also has provided, you'll see in Slack, he's uh, linked to uh, the model. So if you've all got your Insight Maker uh, um, account set up, um, then Dave will also give you a chance to actually have a play around with this model um, as well. So I'm going to hand over to you, Dave, if that's okay. Uh, let me just enable screen sharing for you. Okay, there we go. Over to you. Thanks, Dan. I've just got to try and find my right tab. <laughs> so hopefully everyone can hear me now. Um, and yeah, right. hopefully on the screen you should now see the sort of uh, sort of the sort of system dynamics model that we built for the sort of COVID situation in in Devon. Now, just to give you a, a little bit of a sort of an overview of the sort of structure of the model, it we basically started it. We, really came from initial conversations we had with the public health team so they in public health when they do their epidemiological models they talk about SIR or SIA models which is susceptible infected recovered and that's their basic approach that most epidemiological models are based upon and it introduces the concept like the R value that we're probably all aware of so that, interestingly when the sort of public health guys have their sort of epidemiological models they're all built built in excel you can clearly see that when i sort of first came across it i had a look of horror on my face when i saw that but what we sort of had because um i joined in with part of the hsmo program last year we did some of the system dynamic stuff and sean man he actually sort of went through the session that you've just been through so we thought actually we could use the sort of the insight maker tool and some of the approaches and system dynamics simply to replicate a lot of the sort of public health models but what we could then do is expand from that so actually we could build in the bottom part of the sort of model that you see here so the top part is your epidemiological model but what we really wanted to know is what's the impact on the healthcare system itself so the top part is classic epidemiology and the second part is once you know who's infected we can then sort of translate that into sort of the impact on the hospital system itself so the particular model here you see on the screen is our sort of basic sort of flow model that sort of represents the infection across the system, but also that hospital part of the system. Now, there's a couple of things we actually built in slightly differently here that sort of link to what some of what Dan has said, but 
actually, if I just click on here on the sort of asymptomatic part, actually, if you look over on the right hand side, there's a sort of little box that says delay of four days. So what that basically is, is trying to counter is this idea of a person who's infected instantly um, becomes symptomatic. So flowing through that asymptomatic box very quickly. So what we've done is we built in a time delay of four days. So basically saying everyone who's asymptomatic will stay asymptomatic for four days before before going on to sort of uh, have symptoms essentially of COVID. And what we see is a number of these boxes then make sense. When you look into the hospitalisation box down here, we've got a delay there of 10 days. So that's basically saying the average length of stay of a person who's admitted to hospital in a normal sort of oxygen type bed would have a 10 day delay. And this information is very close to the sort of um, delays that we saw when actually you sort of measure the hospitalisation rates, average length of stay in hospital is about 12 days, but if you add up all the different components, that's the way it sort of works. So the particular sort of models we, we developed, I think what we found is that it becomes a very useful tool to actually demonstrate what's actually happening around COVID. So we actually probably run three sort of different types of modelling to actually represent the situation of COVID. And we often describe them as the short, medium, long-term models. Short-term models are very much around who's infected today and how that is going to project um, cases for the coming week or two. We have this sort of medium term model which is actually developed by Exeter University, which is more of the stochastic type model. And then the third model is this system dynamics one. Now, this system dynamics model is the one that really gives us the sort of longer term view and the one we sort of use really as a sort of more of a teaching aid to a lot of people. So we can run sort of almost like seminars with various boards. And we've done it a couple of times to the MPs in Devon just to give them a better understanding of how COVID works. And I think it really lends itself very much to that sort of uh, sort of live demonstrations, if you like, of how by changing some of the parameters in the model, you can actually run different scenarios and to demonstrate it in, in a sort of real time basis. So that's the general structure of it. Um, now, Dan did sort of mention this other type of variable in the system, that are basically converters. Now, a converter is basically like a glorified variable, but actually what it is, it can vary over time as well. So when we program the R value into our sort of COVID model, this is the sort of profile that we've got. So we set a number of points over the sort of a, a sort of couple of year period. And actually you can see back in the very early days of COVID, the R was probably up near the three value, but we got the model running from around two and a half. We then, as you know, the system locked down on the 23rd of March, that initial lockdown date, and that roughly day 40 of our system. And at that point, our, our value then drops to around 0.74 in Devon. It stayed below one then for quite a long time before creeping up in July. So today we are roughly at around day 260 or so, 262. So you can see how the R value has changed across the Devon system over time throughout that sort of sort of six month period. Now, what I can then do is if I just click simulate and show you the output of the model, this is the current sort of situation that if we carried on the way we were, so if we forget the lockdown decision that Boris announced uh, at the weekend, if we carried on at an R of about 1.5, Two five, which is the current value, we would then see this second wave just growing and growing. So this particular sort of graphic represents the number of hospital beds in Devon that would be occupied by COVID patients. Now some of the things we can do is I can just drag this little slider back and go back in time. So what we're now seeing, this, this is the first wave of COVID that we saw in Devon. So the model was predicting around 210 beds full and actually that was pretty close to the actual peak. So particular model said it would occur around day 60, which is broadly around the Easter weekend. And what we actually see is that pretty much accurately represented what really happened when you build in the various time delays we've had. So what we've done here is I've just, if I click on this separate tab, the model will be actual. What we actually did in our model is actually one of the other converters we added in was to add in the actual number of hospitalizations as well, just so we can have a look what happened. And if I just highlight that, 
can see the output of both the model and the actual number of hospital beds. So you can see that the actual beds is the blue line, the modeled output is the green one. So you can actually see the model itself was tracking the sort of spread of the virus pretty closely in terms of that hospitalizations. Other things we can look at is the number of deaths we expected in the system. First wave, it was a few hundred, but it's sort of, if we carried on, you can see how the number of deaths would just grow and grow exponentially. Um, other tabs, this is the sort of cumulative number of deaths in the system that could happen. Number of patients infected at any given time in that first wave, it's about 500 infected. If we allowed this virus to spread completely uncontrollably, we would end up with people in Devon infected at any given time. So you can flick between the different sort of views and to sort of really describe what's going on in quite a useful way. Other little sort of tools we sometimes use, um, we, you can actually click on these links. So this is a sort of stacked sort of chart here. But if you click on any of these areas, you can actually take off different views to actually see different parts of the model and it just helps people to describe what what is actually happening within the individual groups so if i just quickly take you back now to the sort of model itself the other thing we actually built into the model is, is a recognition that not all people behave in the same way so what we effectively did is actually to vectorize the model and in doing that what we've actually done is split this particular model into three key groups of people so effectively, we, we described when each stock and, and flow, these three core groups, and actually they behave slightly differently. So we described what we call the general population, which is the bulk of the people in, in Devon. But we also separate out key workers, so your NHS and social care staff. Now, this group are more likely to come into contact with the virus itself. And what it basically meant is that the infection rate among staff is actually higher than the, in the general population. So by separating them out, you can actually track things like staff sickness as a separate entity. So if you think a person who works in a hospital is likely to come into contact with COVID patients that they're having to treat, therefore even with PPE involved, actually that virus did spread into the staff group at a higher rate. We also built in one around care home residents, so care home population, again, particularly vulnerable, but also, so not only were, are they in danger of coming into contact with COVID, their risk of mortality is a lot higher. So some of the versions of the model we're working on at the moment, we're going to go a bit further again and actually fully age stratify the model to actually get it to almost run sort of different age groups as well, because age is such a big determining factor between hospitalizations and deaths that we need to sort of model those slightly separately. That was sort of why we sort of vectorized the particular model. But what we can do now, and what I'll just sort of very quickly sort of demonstrate is how we can use this model to actually play through some different scenarios. So if I quickly click on simulate again and look at the sort of base case that we had here. So this is showing the peak of COVID at around 3,100 beds full. And that would occur if I just slide that back a bit. We can see that date is occurring around day 340. So if we sort of remember those sort of numbers, 3,200 at around day 340, what we can actually do now is actually see what happens if we start playing around with the R value. So what I've done is I've quickly just tweaked this one and then we can actually sort of show what would happen then if we go into lockdown as was announced on Thursday and it would then last for about four weeks until the 2nd of December. Those particular dates have just been input here. So if I then quickly lower the R value here to say 0 0.95, so it drops it below one. Now you probably all remember that if the R value drops below one, then the virus stops spreading and actually we start to sort of see, see a reduction in the level of the virus. Now if I then run simulate again, we see the impact of us dropping the R value for this four week period. So what you see, the overall peak that we had before on day 340 at what, about 3,100. If I roll the clock back now, that larger peak has now been pushed to just shy of day 380. So we pushed it back about sort of 50 odd days, but also lowered it to two and a half thousand.
to see the impact of that sort of lockdown decision, how it's pushed not only the peak further into the future, but actually lowered it quite a bit as well. But we look back to the sort of peak of this second wave that as a result of the sort of lockdown decision, the hospital beds in Devon system would peak at around 400 beds full of COVID patients. And that's roughly double the size of our first wave and actually would be a manageable level of demand on the system. So you'd actually see that it, this would take us to around Christmas before the numbers start to increase again. And then we're on a sort of upward trajectory again. And therefore you can see the government will face a subsequent decision on whether to lock down again or not. But it shows how that sort of circuit breaker type intervention, the sort of impact it's done, it sort of do get a small dip and then it would sort of go again. But what we can do is I could lower the R value if we had a more intense circuit breaker. So at the moment I've dropped the R to 0.95. I just put it down to 0.7. If we were even more aggressive in our sort of policy there. And then run the model again. So what we've now done, the third peak is, is about the same size. It hasn't actually changed at all. But what we've done is kicked it further into the future. So actually what's happened here, that peak now is day 430. So what it's done is we've got a much bigger dip as a result of that lockdown that we implemented throughout November and actually it reduces the number of cases here at day 320 considerably. So actually it's the depth of that sort of if the R drops significantly below one when we get the biggest sort of impact of the system. So you can see why certain sort of policy decisions are, are raging as to whether schools and universities should have closed during this sort of circuit breaker as an attempt to try and push the R further and further below one. And this is one of the reasons why that was sort of viewed as actually if we'd have locked down maybe a, a week or two earlier, we could have coincided it with school holidays and it would have had a bigger impact. And we could actually sort of test out some of those scenarios within the local model just to sort of demonstrate to people how those different things work. So I think what we found when we actually sort of run in these COVID models and, and really sort of being able to live demo this to sort of groups of senior leaders in the health system is to be able to sort of talk them through how different things work and actually give us sort of almost as I say a real time demonstration of how the COVID system actually works and how playing different scenarios through it, you can show how different values of R, different durations of sort of lockdown and restrictions, how they can actually sort of play out in real terms over the sort of foreseeable future. And it's just that sort of dynamic arrangement we are enabled to, to run with the model. So are there any questions or comments from anybody on that? Stop sharing. Hello, Dave. I think it's really, really impressive. Well done for producing it. Hi, Dave. Is there any chance you could share us some of the some of the kind of variables that you had to kind of play with to get the various results out? So you know, kind of yeah. speaking earlier, multiplying various stocks by kind of flows. Um, I think that's the right words anyway. <laughs> Can you just share us yeah. a couple that you have? Yeah, no problem. So, so actually, if you look at the sort of model itself, what we've done is, is the ones that are, I think people should play with most readily are either the R value, that's actually the, the yellow hexagon. But what you've actually got here on the right hand side is, is all these different, they're basically the variables in the model that we think are best to be adjusted. And these are these sliders on the right hand side of the screen. So what you can actually start to do is to actually adjust these as well. So take the sort of third one down, symptomatic to hospitalised. This is currently set at 5%. So this is basically saying 5% of systematic patients would be hospitalised. Now, if I just lowered that to 2%, 2 you can either do it via the slider, type the number in, and then you can basically run the simulation on that different hospitalisation numbers. What you can see here, what this one have done is actually significantly lowered the sort of the infection across the population as a result. So our first wave, which was about 200, now dipped down to about 80. And actually, if you hospitalise at that sort of 2%, it sort of drops it quite considerably. 
so that's one of the ones you can play with but basically all these variables here on the right hand side are the ones we encourage people to to have a play with uh, what you would notice actually underneath if I just hide that there's a lot of other variables that we built into the model both for part of the calculation but also in terms of trying to report some of the outcomes of it so we use them to sort of sum up all the sort of people in hospital and so on I and mean, it's defined essentially as a variable but we, we sort of hide them away just to to keep it a bit more simple various things in here around the sort of mortality rates and so on are all sort of adjustable within the model so we can play that in what you'll probably notice with a lot of these variables they're sort of fixed for the duration of the model and that's sort of why we ended up using these sort of converters like the r value things like the shielding number actually we we actually train the model on different sort of effectiveness of ppe so in the early days we had it set at one so basically saying ppe was relatively ineffective but we dropped that rate down to point one now basically saying a lot more ppe we're a lot more aware of the sort of how to manage covid within sort of hospital settings and therefore we're able to sort of use that as a sort of a way of actually improving the system's performance to actually instead of treating variables as a sort of constant number we can actually vary them by time to actually create a better view of the world so but you can have a play with any of these sort of variables and it will sort of then adjust accordingly and so one more question how did you come up you with those comparables was that from research or were we working with other people who who kind of knew that part of the system so they could like influence the model yeah it, a bit of both actually dave to be honest so um a lot of the early model was actually built around the work that imperial college did so actually they published a lot of the sort of core variables around the sort of hospitalization rates lengths of stay and numbers of asymptomatic how many people were covered sort of different stages of the process so we took a lot of that original imperial college work built that into the model and actually the very first projections were based on that imperial college analysis but what we've then done is is as we've learned more and more over time we're able to sort of adjust the variables to to localize them a bit more to our system itself so our systematic to hospitalized numbers running a little bit higher than the imperial college assumption and that's basically because i think in devon we have a more elderly demographic so the likelihood of, of a person being admitted to hospital here in Devon is slightly higher than the, I think the Imperial College assumption was 4.4%. We run it at 5% just to counter that sort of slightly more elderly demographic that we've got. And it's effectively that sort of the age waiting bit that we're sort of building into sort of future models as part of that. But yeah, it, uh, it, it, much of the international research as we can tap into is feeding into this model. And, um, I think what we found certainly in the very early days so i think this this we had a working version of this model really ready from the end of march early april so in terms of where we were in terms of the infection in devon that we had hardly any cases at all uh, so hospitalization rates were sort of around 15 20 at that time so building a stochastic model would be pretty tricky at that time just didn't have enough data so actually this is because it's more deterministic it's a more theoretically driven model so we actually had a, a working model without really having live data going into it and then actually once the virus got to a certain level we were able to work out where in that sort of expansion we were and that's why we we're able to predict probably this was the first model in Devon that really accurately predicted the first wave of COVID because actually we were able to build the model and then train it to the current situation in Devon which is why we we're able to sort of get it pretty quickly and it's only the sort of more recently of, of other modeling techniques come along that sort of been able to replicate something similar so it became a very useful sort of early starter if you like. Are we saying that just under 50% are asymptomatic? Yeah, same? it's gone up a bit since then. Yeah, yeah. So the vast majority of people do recover whilst asymptomatic. I think the current estimate is probably about 60, 65%, I think now. So that's that has crept up a bit. But yeah, it is it's a lot of people that actually don't, don't really display symptoms. So it's Dave, quite a, yeah. Dave, it's Beth. When we did that 
day of testing staff, we yeah. actually um, at DPT, only, I think we tested about 600 staff and only two were asymptomatic. Um, were yeah, so, some people will be I mean, that's, that's recover the while percent. asymptomatic. Yeah. Some will be sort of pre-symptomatic and then will go on to develop symptoms later. So there are different sort of groups there, right. but it also depends a lot on the sort of the type of test undertaken. But actually what we've done with a lot of this work is looking at the sort of the published data on the levels of, so they've tested sort of antibody testing and we tried to make sure that as many of these models are, are tuned in to what the results are of all those antibody testing so we yeah because again we only, the assumptions throughout we only had three and a half percent were antibody of the people that we tested who were more likely to have had it than the people we didn't mm. test for antibodies only about three and a half percent whereas up in london i know it was sort of running the yeah. hospitals up there at 20 wasn't it some of them yeah so so if if, if i just quickly simulate the model again and just and just roll the clock back so we'll just look back at that sort of first wave. <laughs> oh i have done for ages but if we just roll the clock back so if we look really just now at the sort of first wave of, of covid and then i click on this uh, tab so this is looking at the susceptible infected recovered bit so it's actually grouping people up into those sort of blocks now across devon we got 1.35 million people if I just look at all those that, if I take off, actually, I'll leave those on who died and just look at all those, take off the susceptible numbers. This shows the total levels of infections across the population. So it showed in that first wave that we had about 20,000 infected in Devon. So 20,000 out of 1.3 million, you can see that the infection rate was only just under 2% of the population. So actually that probably translates to the sort of figure you're talking about, Bev, in terms of yeah. the sort of the overall Makes level of the infection there. in the population. Mm -hmm. And what we found is it's probably a bit higher in the sort of acute hospital staff where they're actually more yeah. exposed to I those sort of groups. Five and or six, what, Yeah. And, and within this then, what I could do is then if I just take off general population and care home. So this then is the infection, estimated infection levels amongst staff groups only. So actually mm. it gives us a way of actually seeing the different sort of parts of the system. So it actually helps us to drill into that sort of key worker. And if you think there's sort of, I think about 60,000 key workers in Devon, if you count all NHS and social care staff, we estimated maybe three and a half thousand of them would have been infected after the first wave. Um, some of these do need to be fine, fine tuned, but it wasn't far off, I think, what the sort of underlying estimates are if you look at staff sickness levels in those sort of groups. But it amazing just gives the detail, fantastic, really amazing. Yeah, I think people found it very useful because it, it was just the flexibility of the system to be able to to look into different parts of the question. So actually, because mm. we built it up in different ways, we're able to say this is what we think the staff sickness level was. This is the sort of sickness levels in the care home population where they were very high risk you be able to sort of play those different parts in separately. Mm. Did you break it down into separate hospitals so like with Nightingale separate from the rest? Um, we have done um, so we've got versions that run because it's essentially a population driven so we look at it as a sort of northeast southwest populations of Devon so yeah. we run it in that sort of sense so one of the ways to do that is that sort of population box there at the top on the right hand side set the sort of population to a different gear and then just make sure the models align to what's happening in each local system mm -hmm. so what we are starting to pick up is that the more rural areas the virus is spreading slightly slower so what we're tending to see is the virus being higher in urban areas of Plymouth, Exeter, Torbay and so on, and actually lower in areas like North Devon. So it's actually that rurality effect is, is sort of kicking in. So actually we sort of set the R slightly lower in places like North Devon. So it just spreads that a little bit slower. And actually you can start to tune it to what's actually happening in, in those different areas. Mm -hmm. Dave, thank you very much. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Um, really, really uh, uh, brilliant, and so nice to see such a, um, uh, a, a contemporary use for um, system dynamics and, and, and have a real um, impact on the way in which local 
um, decision making was taking place. Um, uh, I'll take a discussion with you offline, but it'd be good to, I think there'd be a lot of interest in this within our um, academic networks um, to, to actually have a look at this. Um, uh, so if you'd be happy to present that again, I think there'd be a lot of interest, in, particularly in Martin's um, uh, national operational research for COVID network. I think there'd be a huge interest in that. Um, yeah. So thank you again for that. So am I right in saying that, that um, so we've got about 10 minutes left um, and uh, I just wanted to, uh, so uh, you're happy for people to sort of go in and have a bit of a play with this model, is that right? Yeah, yeah, if you just create a clone of the model, you should be able to sort of play around the variables in it and just to see, so yeah, it is a sort of a version of the sort of live model we use, so it's, it's not exactly the same as the current one, but it just gives you a sort of flavour of how to sort of play around with it. So yeah, take a clone of the model and have a have a play. Fantastic, thank you, Dave. Um, so yeah, so uh, for the remaining sort of ten minutes for lunch, if you just want to uh, uh, go into the link that uh, Dave set up, um, have a look at the model in Insight Maker, run it. As Dave said, try tweaking some of the the sliders, change the R rate, see how that's uh, impacting things. Get a real feel for um, how these uh, system dynamics models work. Um, and then in the next uh, 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 dynamic session that we do in a few weeks' time, where we look at Insight Maker in more depth, um, you'll actually get a chance to um, uh, have a practice on playing uh, and building a quantitative model. Nothing near as good as, uh, as what Dave's uh, just generated. It is unfortunately about chickens and eggs, um, but it will give you a sense about how these things um, are put together. And there's lots and lots that you can do with these. Uh, these models. So uh, thank you again, Dave. Um, as I say, uh, everyone, if you want to have a sort of play with that, follow um, Dave's link um, and then uh, we will break for lunch at half past. Um, this afternoon, uh, we've got Tom's uh, session on uh, forecasting. Uh, so make sure that you've uh, downloaded all the materials and, uh, and make sure you watch, if you haven't already, the uh, prep video for that which Tom's included uh, information to. Uh, do remember there's a separate Zoom link for Tom's session this afternoon which he has posted uh, in the uh, in, in, in Slack in the module 12 uh, information so um, do have a look at that. Any questions before we uh, before we break away? Great, um, last word for me so just say next week I will post um, information the next couple of days about uh, the sessions for next week but next week we've got um, in the morning you'll have uh, Sean uh, who'll be taking you through introducing you to uh, network analysis which is another way to deal with uh, whole system dynamics um, but to view essentially the relationships uh, between uh, entities within a, a system um, uh, so there'll be lots of information on that uh, and then in the afternoon uh, I will be taking you through um, agent-based simulation um, which is uh, a type of modelling that is uh, has also traditionally been used for uh, pandemic modelling, and indeed, uh, I will be getting you to model uh, the uh, a new pandemic, which which should be a nice break from all of us from reality. I will say, in my defence, I wrote that before, uh, sometime before the uh, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, but uh, you'll get to see how these sort of individual based models, agent based models, uh, work, where you're modelling individual level. Uh, behaviors. Um, you will need to install some software for both of those sessions uh, and I will post information about um, uh, installing Mesa uh, which is a, a pip install in the same way you did for SimPy so I'll provide information on that uh, and uh, Sean will do the same uh, for his session so do look out on Slack over the next couple of days uh, for that information. Uh, have fun this afternoon with Tom uh, and otherwise, as they just use the last remaining time before lunch, or even if you want to play with it over lunch, uh, to have a look at uh, Dave's model. Uh, and as a final reminder, do remember to be thinking uh, over the next few weeks about your projects, um, about your project pitches. Uh, start talking to people about potential project ideas, um, both in terms of what you've seen so far, but also uh, what's coming up. Um, so thinking about the AI and natural language processing stuff as well uh, as what we've um, what we've covered so far. Um, uh, any questions to say please contact me. Uh, thank you once again to Dave, that was a fantastic presentation uh, and I'm sure Dave will be happy to answer any uh, other questions on Slack etc um, as well. Fantastic, if there's nothing else then uh, have a good lunch break and uh, Tom will see you at 1.30. Great, see you guys then.